It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to start by, as Leader of the Official Opposition, welcoming the POA and Bruce Chapman, their President, uh, uh, who I met with several weeks ago, just to say thank you to the police officers uh, that uh, keep our province safe and continue to work with you on issues of privatization, making sure you're able to stay well and continue to do your jobs with the support of, uh, of your province. Uh, Speaker, my first question is to the Premier, who apparently missed me yesterday. Uh, <laughs> Ali Ken Valshi served uh, the Conservative Party in many roles, both in Ottawa and here at Queen's Park. He was even Chief of Staff to the Minister of Finance during his brief stint as interim leader. Yesterday, the Premier struggled to answer some basic questions, so will the Premier today at least admit to knowing Mr. Velshi? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, the OPG is responsible for their own staffing issues. But let, let me tell you what we have done when it comes to the energy file. We ended up saving 7,500 jobs out in Pickering that the Leader of the Opposition wanted to get rid of, that 7,500 families that wouldn't have been able to pay their pay their mortgage, put food on their table, but that wasn't a concern to the Leader of the Opposition. Nope. We cancelled the worst contract there was. It was a green energy scam, I call it, the Green Energy Act. We saved $790 million for the taxpayers of this great province, con you know, cancelling these contracts. Again, a waste of money. We ended up getting rid of the hydro board and the CEO. We're turning hydro around because the number one issue when I crisscross this province, Mr. Speaker, was energy costs. Energy costs to businesses, energy costs Spons. to people that couldn't afford to pay their hydro bills, choosing between heating and eating. Members take their seats. Stop the clock. Members, please take your seats. Should I reread my statement? Yes. Hansard has it. I don't have it. Start the clock. Supplementary. Speaker, um, back to the Premier. When did the Premier learn that Mr. Valshi had been offered a job on Ontario uh, Power Generation? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker. This is, I, I think this is the third day. They just keep repeating and repeating the question. OP, OPG is responsible for their own hiring staff. But I want to thank the Leader of the Opposition to give me an opportunity to tell the Leader of the Opposition what people really care about. And I'm actually going to, there's, there's so many accomplishments this government has made. Matter of fact, there's no government in the history of Ontario that have ended up getting more done in four months than this government here. I, I, I mentioned the 7,500 jobs that the Leader of the Opposition wanted to axe. We put a memorial up for the veterans of the Afghan war, reformed OHIP supporting people in the greatest need, fought for Ontario on the illegal border crossers, cancelled wasteful Plus. contracts, as I said, $700 million, independent financial commission to look into who was spending the money the last 15 years. A line by line Thank you. Order. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, at any point in the history of Ontario, did the Premier discuss Mr. Velshi's appointment to Ontario Power Generation with his Chief of Staff, Dean French? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I, I want to thank the Leader of the Opposition for giving me more time to finish my, all my accompli our accomplishments. We fought for Ontario jobs during NAFTA, yep. protecting farmers, protecting steel workers. We ended a nasty strike at York University. We announced a better local government, reducing the size and cost of government, getting rid of the politicians downtown, City of Toronto, that couldn't get anything done. We challenged the federal government with a carbon tax. We'll be going to court over that. Order. We returned a buck of beer, provided $100 million to fight for Invested 25 million to fight guns and games. Hydro won 
Accountability Act, announce $182 million for nine OPP stations, close driver fees, protecting free speech in Response. universities, increase GO train service in the GTHA, scrap reading. Thank you. Thank you. Stop the clock. I'll remind the House um, to quote a former speaker, when the speaker stands, you have to sit down. Restart the clock. Next question. Leader of the Office. Thank you, Speaker. My next uh, question is for the Premier. The Premier has now had 24 hours to review the newspaper reports and confer with his Chief of Staff, Dean French. Can he now confirm or deny that his Chief of Staff, Mr. French himself, contacted the Chief of Ontario? Uh, the chair rather of Ontario Power Generation concerning the appointment of Ali Ken Velshi to an executive position. Premier, Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ontario Power Generation is responsible for their own staffing decisions. OPG is a Crown Corporation that is responsible for their own staffing decisions. Put differently, all staffing decisions at OPG are made by OPG. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, yesterday the CEO of OPG came to Queen's Park but refused to discuss employment matters with reporters, and government MPPs intervened. Government come to order, government and, gov side. and government, government, side, come and to government order. MPPs intervened to ensure that he did not take any questions about this matter at the Fiscal Transparency Committee. The fiscal Transparency Parency. Committee. Will the Premier ask OPG to make the details of Mr. Valshi's contract public? Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The biggest potential human resources challenge for OPG would have been that if the anti nuclear uh, Democratic Party had power, 6,500 people would have been cut loose. Can you imagine a skilled workforce like that out in beautiful Pickering country looking for work, Mr. Speaker? I can't imagine it. I've looked at all of our nuclear facilities. I'm getting to visit every single one, meeting great workers Order. who are committed to making sure that Ontario has a stable source of electricity from nuclear power. These are significant assets that we appreciate. We appreciate those people, and thank God they didn't have that human resource problem. Please take your seats. Restart the clock. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, the Premier's job is to set a high ethical standard, gover govern in the public interest, and be accountable to the people who elected him. Instead, the Premier seems to think his job involves doing whatever he wants, whenever he wants, and answering to no one at, at, at all. Right. Speaker, the Conservative insider, a Conservative insider, is going to get paid half a million dollars for a single day's work. The Premier's office is responsible for this. Speaker, will the Premier finally show some leadership and tell Ontarians? what role his office played in this abuse of the people's money. Minister. Well, th thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let's turn human resources into an opportunity and talk about what this government has done over the past four and a half months. We've been eliminating the barriers that cost employers and small businesses money to be competitive creating jobs. Opposition Mr. There's, a, come to order. there's a human resource opportunity. It used to be an issue during the decade of darkness, but the people of Ontario asked us to flip the switch on, brighten their horizon and create opportunities for jobs so that the only human resource issues that businesses in this province had was the opportunity to go and hire more people. Order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Next question. Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. My next question is for the Minister of Finance. For weeks now, the government has refused to disclose basic information about contracts awarded by the Ontario Cannabis Store. These are contracts awarded using public money. Will the minister disclose who has won the lucrative contract? Minister of Finance. Thank you uh, very much uh, for the question. So, the Ontario Cannabis Store has a number of contracts and agreements with different businesses and entities that pro provide the recreational cannabis to its customers. I'll break it down 
uh, succinctly. We begin with 32 federally licensed producers, some like Canopy Growth and uh, Up Cannabis. There's a long list that's been published of the 32 vet, uh, licensed producers that we purchase from. That, uh, uh, goes, that product goes to our warehouse, uh, who not only warehouse the products but distribute them. And that, uh, uh, pro that, uh, was, uh, that OCS warehouse uh, speaker was competitively tendered and negotiated under the previous government. Security. Then Canada Post delivers the orders to Shopify. Speaker, security at our warehouse is a top priority and we will not be sharing information on the offer. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the minister might think it's idiotic to be concerned about how the government spends public dollars, but after this past week, people have a right to be concerned about this government's decision-making. When was the contract awarded? How much was it awarded for? And who's Side, getting the money, Speaker? Minister. Thank you very much. So once again, we begin with the 32 published federally licensed producers. We know that we have a warehouse, which I'll talk about again in another moment. We have Shopify, that, who won the contract by the previous government to uh, run our online operation, and we have Canada Post, who deliver it. Now, when it comes to the warehouse, it was competitively tendered and negotiated by the previous government. Security of the OCS Opposition warehouse to is the top priority, Speaker. We will absolutely not be sharing full further information on the day-to-day -day operations. This is a secure facility. The security of those empo employees is of paramount concern, Speaker, and we're very disappointed that the NDP want to pursue, uh, want to pursue information of such a, a supreme uh, 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 confidential nature. Next question. Member from Mississauga Centre. Good morning, Speaker. My question this morning is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Congratulations on her new portfolio. Mr. Speaker, constituents and police officers in my riding of Mississauga Centre have been voicing Order. their concerns about the treatment of our hardworking and dedicated frontline police officers in instances where they administer naloxone to overdose victims. Under a regulation in the Police Services Act, Police officers have been required to report to and be investigated by the SIU in an incident in which a civilian dies after naloxone is administered. Speaker, this requirement is placing unfair burdens on our dedicated frontline officers who, for, who perform their dangerous duties day in and day out to keep our Ontario communities and families safe. To the minister, could you please update the members of this legislature on how our government for the people is addressing this process, which unfairly burdens our brave frontline officers? Mr. Yeah. Community Safety and Correctional Services. It would be an honour and thank you to the member of Mississauga Centre because this is an important issue. But, Speaker, because the Police Association of Ontario is here, because so many frontline officers are joining us today, I would like to publicly thank you on behalf of our government and the important work you do. Know that you have a government who understands the challenging work that you do as frontline officers and that you have a government who is listening. It was a great honour yesterday, but frankly, I really have to give all the thanks to Minister Tobolo because he did all the work in preparation for the announcement. So thank you. Very much appreciated. And I will speak to the specifics of the naloxone change in myself. Supplementary. I thank the minister for her response. It is very reassuring to hear that our government for the people is treating the dedicated and hardworking men and women of Ontario's police services with respect. Our dedicated frontline of officers perform some of the most dangerous work in the province, and we must ensure that they have the necessary tools they need to perform their work safely. I am proud to stand here today knowing that our government for the people is taking action to ensure that the men and women of our police services are better equipped to continue saving lives and keeping our communities safe. 
Speaker, can the minister please explain why this amendment to the Police Services Act needed to be made? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. As the member knows, currently today, our frontline officers, our paramedics, our firefighters are able to use naloxone. They don't have to go through an unnecessary criminal investigation if something goes wrong. And yet, before this small regulatory change was made, our police officers did. It wasn't fair. It wasn't right. We made that change, and I'm proud to stand with Premier Ford and our government to support the people. Next question, the member for Essex. Much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, this is a question about ensuring impartiality in our criminal justice system as police investigate the activities of the Ontario PC Party. As the Premier well knows, there are multiple police investigations involving the, par the party that he currently leads. Yesterday, the government admitted that it would be improper for the government to involve itself in an investigation. For this reason, will the Premier agree to bring in an independent special prosecutor to ensure the complete impartiality of this investigation? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, as I've answered this a couple times already, we can't go, get involved in police investigations, but I'll tell you, I was elected to be a leader of this party to clean up Patrick Brown's mess. That's exactly what I did, and we're moving this province forward in a positive way. Supplementary. Speaker, unfortunately, the level and frequency of the scandals that we're seeing is even making the Liberals blush in this House. That's right. <laughs> Speaker, it is of public importance that this investigation and eventual prosecutions are conducted fairly and impartially. In King the investigations Bond, into possible fraud in the PC nomination in Hamilton West, police report that witnesses have been so far uncooperative and refused to provide statements. This is very concerning because the fact is that one of these candidates at the centre of this nomination battle is now safely employed within the government working directly for the Minister of Health. Speaker, something smells here, and the public just won't believe that the party under investigation can be trusted to prosecute itself. Speaker, will the Premier Question. agree to bring in an independent special prosecutor to ensure the complete impartiality of this investigation? Premier. Members, please take their seats. Through you, Mr. Speaker, the member from Essex is suggesting he doesn't trust our police. He doesn't trust the Hamilton police. He doesn't trust any of the police. I can assure the member from Essex, order. I trust our police. I trust the investigation. Come to order. You know something? I have faith because they're accountable. They're transparent. Unlike the NDP, you don't know where they're coming from. I have all the faith in the world order. in our police across this province. They're absolute champions. That's who I've trusted. I don't have trust in you. Stop the clock. And once again, I'll remind members to make their comments through the chair. Start the clock. Next question. The member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. I'm pleased to hear that our government for the people will be conducting forestry roundtables across the province to, to develop a comprehensive forestry strategy. Currently, Ontario's forestry sector con contributes $15.3 billion to the economy and supports roughly 150,000 jobs in approximately 260 communities across this province. Our forestry sector, sector is a major economic driver in Ontario. However, under the previous government, the industry lost 51,000 jobs. Mr. Speaker, the government is committed to bolstering Ontario's forestry industry and repairing the damage inflicted by the previous Liberal government. Could the minister inform the House of the crucial importance of conducting these roundtables and engaging with stakeholders? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for the question. 
I agree with the member that Ontario's forest industry is a major economic driver in this province, and I'm pleased to announce that I'll be getting on a plane tonight and travelling to Sault Ste. Marie for the very first roundtable. The forestry industry was neglected by the former Liberal government. Restrictions, regulation and tax burdens hindered the industry. Our forestry strategy will help local communities grow and thrive because, Mr. Speaker, Ontario is once again open for business. These roundtables will focus on gathering feedback from forestry stakeholders about the challenges and obstacles that are preventing the industry from growing like we know it can. The information gathered at these roundtables will allow our government for the people to identify what we can do to help the industry and unleash its full potential as a driver for economic growth and prosperity, particularly in Northern Bonds. and Eastern Ontario. Supplementary. Supplementary. I would like to thank the minister for that response, and uh, I'm so glad to hear that our minister is starting right away with these forestry roundtables right now in my hardworking colleague's riding of Sault Ste. Marie. And it's continuing to engage with the industry through a number of roundtables throughout the province and through written submissions and online submissions. There are so many hardworking Ontarians whose families depend on the forestry sector. And I'm pleased to hear that our government, for the people, is committed to strengthening the sector as a whole and opening up to Ontario for business. Can the minister expand more on how our government is supporting the forestry sector in Ontario? Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and again, thank you to the member for the question. Our government for the people has been clear, Crystal clear that we are committed to opening up Ontario for business, and the forestry strategy we are developing will assist in doing just that. Our government will always value and stand up for our forestry industry. Speaker, I was disappointed to hear the leader of the NDP disregard forestry and deem the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry a lower portfolio. Oh, Speaker, thousands of Ontarians earn their living on the through government forestry. Side. Does the leader of the, of the NDP consider them lower as well? Okay. Sorry. The Minister of Natural Resources has a loud voice. The government side is, is so loud I can hardly hear. I'd ask the minister to conclude his comments. Strong voice. Speaker, this government is committed to reducing red tape, improving efficiencies, and identifying opportunities for innovation while ensuring sustainable forest management. Fortunately, we have a government for the people that will always stand by forestry, and I can assure the member and this House that that will always be the case, regardless of what the leader of the NDP says. Next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Speaker, so far this government's record on education has been nothing but cuts, chaos and contradictions. They have cut $100 million in funding meant to tackle the school repair backlog, meaning order. could face side come to order. wearing hats and mitts inside the classroom. They cut the Parents Reaching Out grants, grants that funded important programs aimed at engaging parents in their children's education, and they scrapped the modern sex ed curriculum, leaving young people without the tools they need to face issues like cyberbullying, consent, and to protect themselves from abuse. Speaker, this government has already taken so much out of education. Can the minister tell us what other cuts parents, students, and educators Question. should be bracing themselves for? Minister of Education. Paul Miller Thank you very much, Speaker. And, Speaker, I stand before you today and tell you with my heart on my hand what I am going to cut out is the nonsense oh. coming from yeah. the government. Yeah. She's doing nothing but perpetuating fear and it's got to stop. This is nonsense. Oh. Coming from the government. Oh. Absolutely oh. nonsense. Oh. It's got to stop. I had my earphone in. I couldn't hear the Minister of Education because of the applause from the government side. I would ask the government members to consider that and think about it. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I suspect that I hit a nerve. Uh, back, back to the minister. I'm not surprised. Sure. I am not surprised. 
surprised by this minister's lack of response, response, Mr. Speaker. In fact, last week, the government showed just how unwilling they are to talk about looming cuts. When a journalist asked what cuts this government has in store for our kids' education, the minister's staff replied, let's ignore. So much for transparency, Mr. Speaker, so much for accountability. I ask again, Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell us what further education cuts are coming, or is her government going to continue to ignore the real concerns of parents, students, and educators across Ontario? Minister. Speaker. Speaker, what we need to cut out of this House once and for all is the perpetuating of fear via nonsense yeah, politics. Yeah. The fact of the matter is, the, the fact Order. of the matter is, this province is currently paying. This province is currently paying one point four two six million dollars an hour in interest on our debt. And I'm telling you that we need to be responsible in here. Order. And I'm hearing, Speaker, and everybody needs to take note of that, uh, this comment, that people are appreciating that we are taking our time with our line-by-line -line audit, cutting out the waste because there was a lot of it over the last 15 years. And I'm very proud of what my team is doing in a responsible manner to make sure we support our The member for York Centre will come to order. The member for Essex will come to order. The member for Niagara West will come to order. The member for Niagara West will come to order. The Premier will come to order. The House will come to order. start the clock. Next question, the member for Guelph. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday, the Environment Commissioner revealed that the previous government allowed raw sewage to be dumped into our rivers and lakes 1,327 times last year. This is disgusting. My daughter had one word for it, gross. This is our drinking water. This is the water we take our kids swimming, fishing, and paddling. And we know that climate change will only make this situation worse. One low-cost solution is to stop paving over our green space. So I'm asking today, Premier, will you commit today to protect and expand the green belt to defend the places we love and to protect our water? Premier, Minister of Environment. To the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, through you to the, the member from Guelph, and, and thank you for the question. Uh, he is uh, correct in noting that the Eco Commissioner did deliver her annual report, and there were some some troubling information about about the previous government's focus on on water. and And uh, he has spoken to me this about this uh, individually and personally as well. It's it's something that uh, that will be part of the plan that we will have in we will have coming out at the end of the month with regards to the environment. Uh, it's an important consideration: clean water, clean air, and clean land. And what this party committed to in its election and what we're committed to in our, in our environmental plan that will be forthcoming um, is to make sure that Ontarians have clean air, clean water and clean land. I should reference as well that uh, we are still open for consultations on that. We've had over 5,000 Ontarians contribute and they can continue to until Friday at, uh, at Ontario.climate.ca. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I do hope the Premier will commit to protecting the Green Belt, though. Yesterday, also, the Insurance Bureau of Canada was here raising alarm bells about the cost of climate change, $1.2 billion in insurable losses in the last nine months. That's over $350 per household. Yet the government has no plan to reduce these costs on families. I released a climate change strategy this morning. I have forwarded it to the minister's office. He is welcome to steal every idea in that plan. But my question to the, to the Premier or the Minister is, will the government today commit to pollution targets 
that meet our Paris obligations and leave a livable, affordable future for our children and grandchildren. Minister. So, Mr. Mr. Speaker, and to the member from Guelph, I do appreciate both directly and today his input that he's provided. As I said, over 5,000 Ontarians have provided input directly, and we continue to gather that input. But, Mr. Speaker, the, the member from Guelph also, this morning, he attacked our government. He attacked our government for getting rid of cap and trade, which was a commitment that we made during our election and part of the mandate right. that it elected us. He, he attacked our government for fighting the Trudeau carbon tax, again, something we committed to. Mr. Speaker, we won't apologize for meeting our commitments. We won't apologize for an environmental plan that protects families and protects the environment. Here, here, here. Next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, before I begin, I uh, would just like to welcome to the Legislature a personal friend and colleague of mine, Matt Scoff, President of the Ottawa Police Association, as well as Directors Barmak Anvari, Jamie McGarry and Brian Samuel, Samuel and I look forward to meeting with them later today. Uh, my, uh, my question, Mr. Speaker, is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. We have an ongoing population, uh, aging population in this province and across our country. Our seniors built this great nation, fought in our wars, and made Ontario what it is today. However, sadly, the previous government treated them as nothing but an afterthought for the past 15 years. We have over 30,000 people on wait lists for long-term care beds, and in my riding of Carleton alone, these wait lists are years long. I know this is an issue the minister has advocated for passionately in the past. Can the minister please explain Question. what is being done to invest in additional long-term care beds across my riding of Carleton and Ontario? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. And I would like to thank the member from Carleton for this important question. Our government for the people is delivering on our promise to end hallway health care by taking urgent action to expand access to long-term care, reducing the strain on our health care system in advance of the upcoming flu season, and working with frontline health care professionals and other experts to transform the province's health care system. We are moving forward with building 6,000 new long-term care beds across Ontario, representing the first wave of more than 15,000 new long-term care beds that the government is committed to build over the next five years. We told the people of Ontario we'd make our hospitals run better and more efficiently, and we'd help get them the care they deserve. And, Mr. Speaker, we are keeping that promise. Yes, yes. Supplementary. I'd like to thank the minister for her response, and through you, Mr. Speaker, I'm excited to hear that this is just the first wave of long-term care beds and that we'll see many more beds across Ontario in the coming years. It is clear that with our government for the people, help is on the way. We've done a lot in just four months, and I know that the minister is committed to ending 15 years of neglect. For 15 years, the previous Liberal government failed to take care of the seniors who worked to build Ontario up. Could the minister please provide more details about our plan to show respect for Ontarians who expect and deserve quality long-term care? Minister. And aside from creating more long-term care beds, our government will be extending funding for spaces already operating in the hospital and community sectors across Ontario to help communities prepare for the surge that accompanies the upcoming flu season. Hallway health care is a multifaceted problem that will require real and innovative solutions. Our government will continue to listen to the people who work on the front lines of our health care system as we develop a long-term transformational health care strategy to address hallway health care and end it. Next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is also for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Long, Ontario's families have been stuck waiting longer and longer for the health care that they need. In this week's financial update, it is clear that cuts and privatization will be on the agenda for our health care system. The minister had said so much in recent speeches to the Ontario Hospital Associations and others. Can the minister lay out exactly how privatization and spending cuts will make it easier for people 
to find a family physician or to get the hospital care they need. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, um, Mr. Speaker, through you, in fact, I feel it is really important to address for all members of the legislature and anyone watching these proceedings the actual facts. In fact, I made no such statement. What we are going to do is expand health care across Ontario for the people that need it. That's why we've committed to building or creating 5,000 new long-term care beds within five years. That's why we have committed to 3.8 billion dollars over 10 years to create a connected and coordinated mental health system across Ontario. Those are the things that we're concentrating on. That's what we promised the people of Ontario we would deliver, and that is what we are going to deliver. Speaker, when I hear the minister talk about innovation, I feel like I have seen this agenda before. It is clear during the minister's speeches during the resolutions that will be debated at the PC convention this weekend, when I see things such as a resolution to encourage public and private sector partnership in the delivery of health care system, I get nervous, Speaker. Like Tommy Douglas, the NDP believes that care should be based on needs, not on ability to pay, and that the private health care businesses should not be maximizing their profit on the back of sick people. Can the minister tell us which health care services her Conservative government plans to privatize next? Minister. Let me be clear. No such thing is going to happen. That there are many things that get discussed at party conventions. You have party conventions. Yeah. The other parties have conventions. We have conventions. That does not mean that that's going to become government policy. Not at all. In fact, what we are committed to is making Order. sure that people have access to our health care programs no, across the province. We Order. know that there are areas where that is not happening. We're going to concentrate on that. We are going to work on ending hallway medicine by creating those long-term care spaces, by developing a long-term connected mental health and addiction strategy, by making sure that people get the home care services that they need. That's what we are concentrating our efforts on, by building up our services in Ontario so that all people, all people will have access to them. Thank you. Next question, member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question today is for our fine Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. When we, you know, when we, when we hear, hooray, hooray, I'm not suggesting we accelerate the actions of this House. Of course, what I am referring to is the Tim Horton Briar, yeah. Canada's annual curling championship. Yeah. Now, the winner of the 2020 curling championship will represent Canada a month later at the World Men's Curling Championship from March the 28th to April the 5th in Glasgow, Scotland. Additionally, that winning team will return to defend its title as Team Canada in the 2021 Tim Hortons Briar. Can the minister today inform this house and our government's involvement with this tremendously important 2020 Briar? Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member from Hastings, uh, Lennox, Addington, for the question. I'm happy to tell the House today that after waiting for more than 50 years, Kingston will get its long-awaited second opportunity to host the world's most famous national curling championship. The 2020 Tim Hortons Briar will be played from February 29th to March 8th in downtown Kingston. Kingston is the home to one of the oldest curling clubs in Canada, and it's fitting that the championships are coming back to the city. Great sports like curling strengthen communities and bring us closer together. Additionally, the Tim's Hortons Briar will prove to have a positive economic effect in Kingston and in the surrounding area. Response. It will create jobs and provide opportunities to meet and socialize. I congratulate the City of Kingston for this great achievement. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd certainly like to thank, thank the Minister for that response. You know, Kingston last hosted the Briar in 1957. Wow. 
a long time ago. Yes, it is. When Alberta's Matt, I even remember. <laughs> when Alberta's Matt Baldwin hosted the Tankard following the perfect 10 and 0 round robin performance at the Kingston Memorial Centre. But the Briar, you know, it's not only an opportunity for Ontarians to come together and support our sports sector, but it's also a tremendous opportunity to promote the economic growth that is so important to all of these regions. So can the minister today elaborate on the importance of the Briar for Ontarians and all of our local communities? Mm -hmm. Response, minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that uh, question. Ontario's government for the people is open for business and committed to supporting the continued success of our sports sectors. In many communities across Ontario, curling is an essential part of our cultural heritage and our identity as proud Ontarians. It's a time for all provinces and territories to come together for what is one of the most prestigious trophies in Canadian sport. The Briar will be a positive economic and social benefit for Kingston and for all Ontarians who will gather to watch the championship from across the region. That's why I'm happy to congratulate Kingston today and look forward to the camaraderie and competition that will be taking place shortly in Kingston. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Ontario's Black Youth Action Plan was a commitment and investment in black children, black youth, and their families. Funding meant enhanced youth outreach by youth workers who received anti-racism training in order to better support youth experiencing trauma or mental health challenges. Black youth and their families would also be connected with community-based services and resources, as well as provided with culturally appropriate mentorship. To date, the Conservative government has not made combating systemic anti-black racism a priority and has instead relied on pre-written scripts to evade talking about real action. Will the minister be continuing the funding for the Black Youth Action Plan, yes or no? Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you to the uh, member of the NDP for the question. You know, I, it's interesting to me that we hive off these individual issues, and yet when we say we are reviewing all programs, we are looking at every single program that our government provides to ensure that it is providing the appropriate outcomes and getting what the people of Ontario need and deserve. That's what our responsibility is as government, and that's what we are doing. Yes, it takes time. Yes, it is going to be thorough. But we are doing a line-by-line, -line, program by program audit to ensure that the outcomes that were promised are actually being delivered. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And back to the minister. Not talking about systemic and institutionalized racism doesn't make it go away. The Anti-Racism Directorate, which is something that the Ontario NDP has long been, been advocating for, was the government's commitment to building a more inclusive society and its commitment to identifying, addressing and preventing systemic racism in government policy, legislation, programs and services. It's estimated that the racialized population in Ontario will be 48 per cent by 2036, which means that the work of the Anti-Racism Directorate is critical for supporting the needs of our increasingly diverse population. Will the minister be maintaining the Anti-Racism Directorate with adequate, adequate resources to do their job? Yes or no? Minister. Thank you. You know, I think it's important for the members of the NDP to understand that we work as a team here together, and I am incredibly proud of my parliamentary assistant, the member from Brampton South, who is taking these files and doing and making the lead on it. Because we understand the importance of protecting our young people, we understand the importance of ensuring that the programs we are providing are getting the outcomes that we want. And my parliamentary assistant, our team member, the Brampton, the member from Brampton South, is doing that. And I know that with his thoroughness, we will get there with appropriate outcomes that actually are going to make a difference for the people and the children of Ontario. Order. 
Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Oakville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. Thank you. Uh, Speaker, my question is for the uh, President of the Treasury Board. My constituents are concerned about how years of Liberal mismanagement have left the province's finances in terrible shape. Shame. Shame. They're also concerned about how the damage wasn't limited only to the public accounts, but to public trust. That's why it's so important to hear during a speech last week that the President of the Treasury Board talked about restoring accountability, trust to government. Here, here. In fact, I was interested to see that just yesterday, the President of the Treasury Board attended a town hall with employees from the ministry to answer many of their questions. Can the President of the Treasury Board please inform this House what actions the ministry is taking to reinstall transparency and accountability throughout government? Good question. Good question. President of the Treasury Board. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member from Oakville for that thoughtful question. Since being sworn in, I've visited uh, hundreds of the ministry staff in their offices to discuss how, what they do and how they are doing it. Mr. Speaker, people are hungry for change. That's why we've consulted public servants through our Big Bold Ideas Challenge, and we've received thousands and thousands of great ideas from our Ontario Public Service on how we can transform government, Mr. Speaker. My speech last week was called The Challenge of Our Generation. Well, it was made clear during the town hall yesterday that the staff of the Treasury Board Secretariat are ready and able to meet that challenge, Mr. Speaker. I look forward to working with them and all of my colleagues as we transform government and serve the people of Ontario together. Here, here. Supplementary. Good answer. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the President of the Treasury Board for uh, the answer. It's, uh, I must say it's refreshing to have uh, uh, such an engaged and knowledgeable President of the Treasury Board. Here, here. Here, here. It's been said that no single person has a monopoly on good ideas. That's why the Planning for Prosperity Survey has received over 26,000 ideas wow. from members wow. from the public eager for change. Wow. Only by consulting a wide range of Ontarians can we understand what actions we need to take to repair the years of damage caused by the Liberal mismanagement? Years. It's important that we ensure our province is modern and fiscally sustainable for this generation and for the next. Can the President of the Treasury Board please inform this House what ideas were brought forward in the TS TBS TBS Town Hall concerning modernizing the public service? Excellent question. Well then, President of the Treasury Board. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again through you, thank you to the member for that question. Yesterday. As I looked out at the crowd at the town hall, I was struck by the young, diverse, and many talented people that we have in Treasury Board Secretariat. Uh, in fact, uh, a TBS employee is here today, Colin. I don't know where he is in the gallery, but he's responsible for the digital documents in Cabinet to support our meetings. That's the kind of modernization that we need to continue to drive. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's all about, up to all of us to work together as we deliver a modern, sustainable government that serves the people, not the other way around. Here, here. I'm confident that, to, that together we will meet the challenge. We have to, for this generation and for future generations. Mr. Speaker, together we are restoring trust, we are renewing accountability, and we are reestablishing transparency, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. Question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. 113 people applied to appear before the committee that will analyze rollbacks of our employment and labour standards just tomorrow. That's 113 people for only 20 spots over a five-hour period over one day. And these people applied from Peterborough, from Barrie, from Thunder Bay, from Ottawa, from Cambridge, from Brantford, from Chatham. And it's only for the people who can make it to Toronto just tomorrow. Does the minister think that that is enough consultation on this regressive piece of legislation? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thanks uh, very much uh, for the question this morning. And, uh, Speaker, I'm pleased to, to answer it. Bill 148 was the most harmful piece of legislation that was brought forward for businesses in Ontario in our generation. We ran an election, we ran an election in the spring on making changes to Bill 148 to ensure that Ontario was open for business again. And I can tell you that when Bill 148 
was introduced by the Liberal government, our members went out then and met with business owners, employers, even employees across the province and heard directly from them, Mr. Speaker, that this piece of legislation, Bill 148, was killing jobs across Ontario. It was a job killer, Mr. Speaker. And since the election, since the election, my two parliamentary assistants, Skelly and Parsa, have been fanning out and hearing directly from employers as well. We've heard loud and clear. We're on the right track here, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the, the government is imposing serious, far-reaching, regressive changes to labour laws and employment standards across this province. Across the board, wages will be cut, paid sick days will be slashed, workplace rights removed, but the government doesn't seem to have the decency to hear from the people of this province, from hard-working Ontarians, shutting down the voices of the people of Ontario on a bill that will directly impact them is undemocratic and it affects the quality of the life of workers Order. in this province. Premier, let the people in and let them be heard in this bill and make sure that you extend the delegations on Bill 47. Will you do the right thing? Will you? Thank you. Response. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I can tell you that um, when the Liberals introduced Bill 148 in this House, we heard loud and clear from people across Ontario that that piece of legislation, which was supported by the third party at the time, potentially headed for third party status again, Mr. Speaker, wasn't doing anything to grow the economy in Ontario. It was killing jobs in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. It was sending employers outside of our jurisdiction to the United States tack on the high cost of electricity, and the NDP supported that legislation as well, the Green Energy Act, and tack on the cap and trade, Mr. Speaker, Order. the NDP supported the Liberals on that piece of legislation as well. Order. These guys have done everything they can to drive jobs out of Ontario. Hey. We're doing everything we can to make sure that Ontario hey. is open for business. Order. <laughs> Order. 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 <laughs> Member for York Centre, come to order. <laughs> Start the clock. Member for Sarnia Lampton. Mr. Speaker, to you and through you, to the Minister of Agricultural, Food and Rural Affairs. Mr. Speaker, this year we have seen unprecedented levels of momotoxin, mold, and corn across the province and in North America. Farmers in my riding and indeed across the province are struggling to keep their businesses operating during this harvest season because of the rising levels of mold, resulting in some corn being rejected at the grain elevators. Farmers are struggling to get their corn to market. Agri-food businesses are struggling to produce feed, and livestock farmers are worried about providing their animals with nutrition. This is a, an issue, Mr. Speaker, that is affecting the agricultural industry across the board. Can the minister please tell us what farmers can do? Good question. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Well, thank, you, uh, thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you very much to the member from Sarnia Lambton for that very important question. As the member highlighted, this year has seen an unprecedented amount of vomitoxin in corn, and I'm aware that farmers across the province are frustrated about the impacts on their business. I understand how challenging this is for not only Ontario farmers, but also the hard-working people across the entire agriculture industry. 
My ministry encourages farmers to harvest as early as possible to avoid having the disease spread further across the field and to keep storage bins clean and separate from the diseased corn. I encourage all farmers to contact AgriCore for more advice on what assistance is currently available for them. I continue to meet with those impacted across the industry. My ministry Response. and AgriCorps will continue to keep farmers informed on any new next steps. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and to you and through you to the minister, uh, thank you for his response and leadership on this issue. I've heard from a number of farmers who have, find ha have found high levels of vomitoxin in their corn, and the number of concerns I'm hearing from them is increasing every, day by day. Some farmers are not able to get their corn to market as their crops are being rejected at the elevators. Some uh, for the level of mold. Farmers are beginning to contact agricar Agricor for assistance on what to do with impacted corn and what this means for their production insurance. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell us what this government is doing to help farmers and provide them with the assistance that they so desperately need? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, I thank the member for the supplementary question. I want to assure the member that my office is in contact with Agricor and those across the agriculture industry on next steps. And the best practice is to provide a timely and effective solution for all these impacts. I acknowledge the challenges and the hurdles our farmers and agri-food industries are experiencing. Frequently rainy weather, amongst many other factors, has contributed to the problem and has made harvesting a challenge. Tomorrow, I will be hosting a roundtable with those across the value chain, from grain farmers to ethanol companies, feed producers, and to livestock farmers, to gather input from those impacted in the sector. Mr. Speaker, I will work tirelessly with our partners like AgriCorps to find solutions and support Ontario's hardworking agricultural workers. My ministry is committed to working with the farming industry and providing Response. all those impacted with clear and effective solutions. And I thank the member again very much for the question. Next question. The member for Niagara Falls. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. One of the most significant heritage assets in the Niagara Lake is the Rand Estate. The town of Niagara Lake recently moved to designate the Rand Estate under the Heritage Act for its local and national cultural heritage significance. That designation is now being appealed by the developer who instead wants to develop this historic property. This same developer now, today, is taking a chainsaw to this extremely important site. Mr. Speaker, the province has the tools available to help the town of Niagara on the Lake and its residents regain control of what's happened on this site, including under the Planning Act. Speaker, will Question. the minister take action to ensure that this jewel in Niagara on the Lake is not lost forever? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks very much, uh, Speaker, and I want to thank uh, the honourable member for uh, putting his question uh, to me this morning. Uh, I, I'm sure he knows that I obviously have to be careful in my comments, given that the matter is before a tribunal. But I am very concerned and very interested in to the points that he made uh, regarding uh, what's happening on the site this morning. Uh, I would like to, uh, through you, Speaker, offer uh, the opportunity to, uh, to sit down with the member and gain uh, further insight into what's actually happening in his riding. Uh, if he would uh, afford me that opportunity, I'd, uh, I'd give him some time after question period. Thank you very much. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This week, the developer virtually clear-cut a quarter of the site. He is thumbing his nose at the town of Niagara on the lake and its residents, and if you can imagine this, who are now engaged in acts of protest to try to stop this deliberate destruction of this cultural heritage jewel. The residents are doing everything they can to raise opposition to this. He's chopping down trees that are 150 years old. Speaker, will the minister stand with the residents of Niagara on the lake and issue an order under his powers in the Planning Act to protect this historically significant property. Thank you. Minister. 
Uh, again, Speaker, uh, through you to the honourable member, I, I don't have any uh, further information to add. I've made my offer. Uh, I'd be more than happy to uh, to sit down with you. But again, you have to be you have to be with all due respect to the heckling from across. Matters in uh, before the tribunal are very very um, delicate. And, uh, but I, I, do, I do value the member's information that he's placed uh, before this House, and uh, I look forward to speaking to him after the question period. Thank you. Next question, the member from Milton. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, the residents of my riding of Milton know that carbon tax will raise the price of everything. This tax is hurting our most vulnerable. It hurts our families, it hurts our seniors, it hurts our job creators, and it hurts the prosperity of our province, Mr. Speaker. I'm proud to oppose this tax, and I'm proud to be part of a government that is cutting taxes and not raising them. Through you, Mr. Speaker, can the minister outline our efforts to oppose this aggressive tax? Thank you. Mr. The Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member, member from Milton. The member from Milton. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, it's never been more important than now for this government, uh, under the leadership of Premier Ford, to stand against the, the Trudeau Liberals. Um, as you know, our Premier has been leading a growing coalition of provinces. There are now six oh, provinces really. that stand, stand opposed to the, uh, the federal government climate plan. And this could never be more important because what? just just yesterday, and, and I'm, I've had to learn, Mr. Speaker, to parse the statements of my, my federal counterpart, but just yesterday, the federal minister of the environment talked about, um, under, under questions about the fact that the carbon tax, according to economists, wasn't high enough to be effective. It was, uh, it was only going to add $648 to the price of a, of a family's year. But she said the focus now, and I have to translate this, the focus now is on to implement a climate framework. By that, they mean a carbon tax, and then, then move forward with increased targets in the future. Not Mr. Again. Speaker, we don't know how much it's going to cost Ontario families. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for his answer. And back to the minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Financial Accountability Officer of Ontario reported that the cost of Trudeau carbon tax is well over $600. It is unfair to impose this tax on working families. And the people of Ontario agree, Mr. Speaker, they do not want to see higher gas prices or groceries. Speaker, can the minister update us on what the next steps we're taking to protect our jobs and oppose this tax, Mr. Speaker? Minister. Mr. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member from Milton. The member from Milton. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the Financial Accountability Officer did identify $648, as, as the member pointed out, per family by 2022. And as I just pointed out, the federal government isn't done yet. The federal government is talking now actively and publicly about how much they plan to increase that tax. And that's why we have a number of steps that I can, I can talk about. We are, of course, using the courts. And uh, as we talked about, no stone will go unturned. So we are supporting the government of Saskatchewan's um, re review of this. We will have our own, for which our factum will be filed at the end of the month. Um, we will also be taking, taking other steps in terms of working with other governments. Mr. Speaker, the Federal Minister of Environment cancelled cancelled the regular face-to-face -face meeting of environment ministers in Ottawa, where this was going to be the first item on the agenda. Great. I wonder why that is. Okay. So we'll follow up with those other ministers and take all the steps we can within our power. That concludes the time for question period. The member for University Rosedale has a point of order. Uh, I'd like to introduce Uriah Ravitz Heller. He's from Bork, Bork Collegiate, and he will be uh, working with me today as part of Take Our Kid to Work Day. Thank you for coming. The member for Toronto St. Paul's point of order. Speaker, I'd like to rise on a point of order to uh, welcome my goddaughter. 
Jasima Vasil Hewitt to our house, to your house. I'm so proud of you as a student leader, and it really warms my heart to see you here today. And of course, thank you. And again, I'd uh, just like to introduce uh, or welcome Forest Hill Collegiate now that they're in the space, and Mr. Ferroni for being here today for take our, our kids to school, to work day. Thank you very much. The Minister of Labour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to welcome Andrea Young and Kenesha Taylor from my office to the legislature today. Welcome. The member for London North Centre. Thank you, Speaker. I'm standing today to recognize the beginning of Transgender Awareness Week and that November 20th is Transgender Day of Remembrance uh, to honor the trans people who have been victims of hatred, violence, and murder. Thank you. Mr. Training Colleges and Universities. I would like to welcome two groups of students to the, to, today in the gallery, uh, the College of Student Alliance, including their president, Brittany Gregg, and uh, the Ontario Undergraduate Student Alliance, Danny Chang, Mitchell Pratt, Karen Albrecht, Julia Goldner, Peter Hennen, Beth Lindsay, and Aidan Hibma. Welcome to Kings College. Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you. I'd like to uh, welcome Cy Eber, a friend and a resident of Toronto, to Queen's Park today. Member for Stormont Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to welcome Dave McLean and Jeff Long from the Carmel Police Association. Great meeting this morning. For Barry Innisfil. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I was mentioning, today's Environment Industry Day, and I wanted to remind everyone the Ontario Environment Industry Association is having um, a reception this evening, and I would like uh, to remind all members from all parties to join us in Committee Room 228 this evening for the reception. Member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to welcome a, a constituent of mine from North Hastings, uh, Velma Waters, a lovely lady who always thinks outside the box. Government House Leader. Speaker, I just noticed uh, we have one of the strongest police officers in Ontario standing up there. Pat Como from the Belleville City Police has joined us today. Hey, Good hey, to see you, Pat. Hey, Pat, can you come down and arrest him? <laughs> Once again, we welcome all visitors to the Legislature today. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Kitchener Centre has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services concerning the Black Youth Action Plan and Anti-Racism Directorate. This matter will be debated today at 6 p.m. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Guelph has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks concerning protecting the Green Belt and climate change targets. This matter will also be debated today at 6 p.m. I beg to inform the House that pursuant to Standing Order 98C, a change has been made to the order of precedence on the ballot list for private members' public business, such that Mrs. Gretzky assumes ballot item number 45 and Mr. Rakosevic assumes ballot item number 57. There being no deferred votes, I'm going to give you this. Excuse me. Excuse me. Hi. Yes. Take that back down. There being no deferred votes, this house stands in recess until 3 p.m.